Uh, it's with great pleasure uh, that we interview Dean David Greer. It is uh, June 7, 2006, and we are in the CIT building on Brown University campus. Uh, this is part of the continuing series of archival interviews for Brown Medical School, and we're particularly happy to be able to interview uh, Dean Greer, who was the second dean of the medical school and had a fundamental role in its uh, foundation and development. So just to start out, I was wondering if you could tell a little bit about a little bit about your life story and how you ended up at Brown. I uh, embarked in, uh, on an academic career in medicine uh, at the University of Chicago. I was a student there and then a resident there. And and I had a lab, and I, I was a bench scientist uh, in a highly specialized uh, organization. Uh, I was in the secular part, the division of uh, endocrinology, and, a, and a, quite a biochemist and molecular biologist, and so on. And I grew tired of that uh, because there was not enough human interaction, and it was, it was too specialized. I, I like to take care of people, not diseases. And so I uh, disappointed everybody at the uh, apex of my young career by um, moving to Fall River to just go, go into non-academic practice in a, in a community that uh, was in dire need of, of uh, physicians, uh, largely because it was uh, a community with the lowest uh, per capita income, uh, the lowest educational attainment rate, and uh, uh, the uh, lowest uh, doctor to population ratio in all of Massachusetts. I spent a very happy uh, 17 years there, uh, uh, practicing general medicine, taking care of families and so on. When they uh, decided to initiate a medical school 18 miles from my office at Brown, I was doing some things which interested them, uh, and they, uh, a uh, uh, distinguished alumnus who happened to live in Fall River, uh, was distinguished first of all by his uh, career, and then second of all by the fact that he was a major donor to the medical school, uh, requested that the dean come over to Fall River and, and interview some of the doctors who were practicing there, see if they couldn't be some sort of educational program uh, initiated in Fall River, which had no medical educational programs. Uh, they came over and met my waiting room. Uh, I told them about a program that I had started, uh, which had grown to be a, a monster in my life, a wonderful monster, and that is a, a hospital for the treatment of people with chronic diseases, chronic disabling diseases, and also for their rehabilitation. And this had grown, this was a very large enterprise, uh, which was a voluntary thing for me. Uh, it was owned by the city of Fall River. And it had some interesting features, uh, in, including the first um, uh, hospital-connected, federally supported housing development in the United States with service uh, input. Uh, which was a forerunner uh, uh, for the you know, current uh, assisted living facilities in the United States. Uh, he asked me to, uh, uh, the dean came over and visited all the things I was doing. He asked me if I would take a voluntary appointment and have some students in community health. They were looking for uh, uh, connections in various community agencies, and that had not worked out well for them, apparently. This was the new medical school. They just they started their clinical rotations in 1973, and that's when they were talking to me about this. I, uh, has, I reluctantly, although I would love to teach, but I had a mammoth practice, and went 24-7 around the clock, you know, no interns, just the me and the patients, and that was the, uh, the extent of it, so it was a very demanding life. But at any rate, I agreed to take a student to a year uh, who might be interested in chronic disease and rehabilitation. Well, that rapidly developed into a half of the class coming to Fall River, apparently it was popular. 
which was uh, overwhelming in effort. Uh, some months of that, it was apparent to me that uh, this couldn't go on. I'd already hired another person in my office to take care of all the new new people who were wandering around and uh, so on, and, and arranging things for them. So I, I could see that this something had to give, which apparently the uh, university, the medical school, built too. So they uh, spontaneously offered me a position, and I became an instant uh, professor of community health and associate dean of the medical school, which uh, when I tell people that story, uh, they can they can get over the marvel of that coming from from this uh, humble uh, family practice in this uh, depressed community to the number two uh, uh, role in a new medical school as, as well as, as a senior professor. I came and I, I started my voluntary work, I work, did that for almost a year, 1973. I came in the spring of 1974 in those capacities. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of, of, of bringing me here was to bring the community to have some sort of connections with uh, uh, practicing physicians. Uh, and I, we can talk about the need, the need for that, which was a particularly acute in this kind of a setting, and also with community agencies and pol political people and so on. And it's much too a, much of a dispersion right now. But one of the things that was attractive to them was that I was very active in public life in the southeast of Massachusetts, was the chairman of the board of the state university and, and all kinds of governor's commissions and so on and so forth. So they felt that I was someone who understood the public sector of course, I practice in the, with the private practice group, so the, I understood the uh, strange psychology of, of private practitioners of medicine. And there was nobody else here at that time who had that background. So that was 1974, beginning of 1974. Beginning of 1974? Yeah, it was, a, uh, it was uh, in the spring. Uh, that I left, although I made the decision in the late winter, and I took three months of transition to this poem. This was a very, very emotional experience for me and for my patients. Uh, well, many of them were very dependent on me. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, it was such an emotional experience that the, my first day on the job at Brown, I was in the coronary care unit at the Truesdale Hospital in Fall River. <laughs> but thankfully, I. Uh, I uh, didn't have a look at my, I, my guy on auction, and I got out of there in three days. They said it was stress, I knew it was angina, and then a few years later my impression was confirmed by the treadmill and a whole bunch of, of uh, circumstances which led to my coronary bypass surgery in 1979. Hmm. Uh, so that essentially my first task getting a little bit further afield if you want to stop me. Well, if you want to even go chrono chronologically, you were, you were here in the spring of 74. What no. was, what were well, you Well, the first thing I was faced with uh, uh, was, besides the fact that I was given them the uh, mission of, of introducing the medical school to the broad community and, uh, and seeing how many people are out there, professionals and others, who would like to participate in some way in a new adventure. I spent the first six, eight months on the job. Every morning I'd get up and I'd travel to another community facility from Westerly up to Osaka and so on. And I'd made an appointment to meet whoever the person was there, some uh, uh, community agency, some hospital director, some, uh, medical society uh, leader, or whatever, and tell them my story of this new medical school, my mission, and this. Uh, assess whether they have any interest in participating in any way. I made a, a dossier, I hope, um, unfortunately, I don't think I saved that. You asked me about archives, and I, I doubt that that's still available anywhere, but I could, I could hunt. Uh, and the second thing, I mean, simultaneously, is something which would be of interest because it turned out to be a major venture, 
was I was given the uh, mission of starting a family practice residency and a family practice program. That was a ma major priority in the United States in the 19, early 1970s, uh, recommended by numerous commissions and uh, pol political people and so on. Uh, they wanted to bring back the old-fashioned community family doctor. And they, were, they felt that there was over overemphasis on high-tech specialties and so on in medicine. And they were not producing the kind of doctors who really were needed in, 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 uh, in communities in, in terms of taking care of families and, and participating in community affairs. The governor of Rhode Island had uh, mandated a, an additional uh, uh, sum of money for the creation of, a, uh, over and above whatever the hospitals were approved to spend, for the creation of a, uh, of a family practice program. That was common among governors in the United States at that time. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, of course I arrived and I was the closest thing that this uh, university had to a family doctor. I, mean, I felt I was a family doctor except I didn't, it's a very new specialty so I didn't have a chance to trained as a family doctor, I trained as an internist, uh, but I thought I was a pretty good family doctor. I guess people did too here because I started the program in Pawtucket, the Pawtucket Memorial Hospital, now known as Memorial Hospital of Rhode Island, uh, volunteered to initiate the program. The appropriation was given to them. Uh, it was not a program that was uh, thought to be desirable by most hospitals with an interest in high-tech specialty kind of medicine. So uh, that was unusual for hospitals to actually want to do this. And uh, so I went out to Pawtucket, uh, which uh, I felt very comfortable early on because uh, it was not unlike Fall River, a depressed uh, blue-collar community and so on. And that unlike the hospital that I practiced in before, or through there once. So I started the daily practice program there, and I, I actually went to Kansas City, and I found it the mecca for the Academy of, uh, of Family Practice, uh, and spent uh, uh, 10 days or so there being introduced to the specialty. I had no idea what the requirements were for training family physicians. I was also introduced to the leaders of the, uh, uh, they were having a, some sort of a uh, conclave and the, the very early leaders of the movement, all of whom were people like me because they, there were no uh, lifelong academic professors in family practice, so they plucked them out of communities for various reasons and made them uh, the leaders of this new specialty organization. So I obviously got along very well with those fellows, not only in the seminar room, but in the bar and so on. It was a very cordial. And indeed, I had a number of them here in Tucket as consultants in the development of the program. Do you remember any of their names? Uh, Stern was one. Uh, he came from California where he'd been some sort of a Hollywood-related practitioner. I remember one very well, seriously, he was a very major person, the chairman at Minnesota, which was the, the, the largest program in the United States. Uh, and he was a world, he flew in on his own airplane. He was still in practice in whatever that International Falls, Minnesota on the border, that's the general practice there. He was flying back and forth in his practice at his chairmanship in, 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 in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, he was a, really a whirlwind of a guy. Uh, so much so that he was uh, very much resented by the rest of the medical school <laughs> in, in, in Minnesota. And indeed, the legislature, out of uh, sheer frustration, they, they were making allocations to, for this family practice program, which got lost in a black hole in the medical school dean's office. So they actually would established a, a system where the allocations for family practice at the university were made directly to the chairman. 
it's bypassing the rest of the people who are so hostile. Uh, and uh, let's see who else. There was a fellow named Carmichael from Florida. Uh, very interesting, uh, admirable guy. Uh, those are the ones off the top of my head I remember. It's quite a while ago. And all, all of the three people that I mentioned just now were here and helped me start the program. Of course, we had to, try to, had to get accredited, the whole uh, bureaucratic process, which took about a year, but we, I think as I remember, the first residents arrived uh, in, in 1975. Uh, and they, they turned out to be pretty good people, even though we got a late start. Uh, and their program has flourished, as you all know, being the current chairman. It's, uh, it, it rapidly took its place. Uh, as one of the premier programs in the United States, uh, and uh, it has to maintain that reputation, I think. It's a marvelous program. And unfortunately, the whole field of family practice and general medicine in general has been in decline, and there's been more and more of an imperative in medicine to be more technical, more specialized, and subspecialized, and so on. So it's kind of uh, swimming against a very strong mainstream, but it, at least in Pawtucket, it seems to be able to thrive. At the time, what was the attitude of the medical, of this evolving medical school? Why why did they go into family medicine? What was their kind of stakeholder? Well, role? They, they had no stakeholders, and in fact, uh, nobody wanted it. Family medicine, since I was now in the Department of Community Health, which, by the way, consisted of three full-time faculty, uh, so therefore, very chummy group, and I got along with well two of them, uh, both of whom are still on campus and retired. <coughs> the, uh, uh, so we made it. We made that a program in the in the Department of Community Health. The, uh, the Department of Internal Medicine had not, would have nothing to do with it. In fact, they would, wouldn't even develop a general internal medicine program. They didn't want any generalists. They thought it was a regressive move. I'm not sure they may still think that as a matter. Uh, the uh, and so the first uh, general internists as well as the general family practitioners were appointed in the Department of Community Health, and then was a section of Community Health for many years. I don't know, it took a long time for that to change. Uh, now the reason that we had it is this: uh, there was this uh, uh, widespread national perception that we had a shortage of physicians in the late 1960s and early 1970s in general. And a particular shortage of generous physicians who would go into communities and take care of broad populations rather than look for diseases that they specialize in and uh, be focused on their disease rather than on, on the people involved. That may be a little harsh, but that was the, uh, the uh, general consensus. Not in the profession, the profession resisted this so long uh, that the, the uh, the internal medicine establishment nationally refused to have a section of family medicine in, in their departments. In the they didn't want an internal medicine, general internal medicine either. Uh, this was a public uh, clamor expressed through various state politicians in particular to have this kind of training program, this kind of orientation. <coughs> now, uh, uh, and so that, that, that uh, contagion spread the governor uh, here in Rhode Island, and he was the one who took the initiative to just give him the money and put to somebody that would volunteer to do it and, and just fight the establishment. Uh, now, the, uh, 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 the attitude of the general faculty in the university uh, was even more interesting. First of all, there was much uh, opposition to having a medical school here. And indeed, so much opposition that it was almost, I think it was uh, uh, almost 20 years, well, not quite, before we were uh, committed to call ourselves a medical school. We were a program in medicine, it was a, part, it was a division of biology and medicine. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, that was very symbolic here. It, this university does not, did not, and does not have any uh, independent schools. 
it's a unitary faculty. Everybody gets a point on the same faculty, unlike, let's say, other Ivy League schools where if you're a medical school appointee, uh, law school appointee, you have no privileges in the other schools. You have to apply to a new person if you want to do something in the other school. But here, that's not true. There's a broad university wide uh, faculty. Uh, and the, uh, the, therefore, uh, uh, the faculty, including you know, uh, the whole uh, gamut of uh, social sciences, humanities, uh, various esoteric uh, uh, philosophical uh, other uh, departments, uh, had a real pr trouble uh, understanding why uh, they should be training community physicians, uh, fairly fragile people, which seem to be a some sort of uh, romantic concept left over from previous times uh, they were concerned. And they just didn't think that Brown ought to be doing that kind of thing as an elite Ivy League uh, institution. And they didn't think they would have a medical school. In fact, there was strong uh, sentiment, really vehement. Uh, I think that probably uh, the fiery debates probably appear in some of the uh, university minutes. I'm sure they do, as a matter of fact. Of the opposition to the medical school. The opposition to medical education, which they felt was a vocational and not an uh, academic pursuit. And they turned on the concept of having a law school, and they did it again and again. They didn't want to have a business school, even if they were given a large uh, uh, contribution by alumni to start one. Uh, all these things were going on in those, that decade or two early on. We just, and were you involved in, in these debates? In, in well, only as a member of the faculty. Uh, and uh, no, I was not any, leading any charge to have other schools. I had, I had a, a, enough, of, enough, of, enough of an onus on myself to try to prove my mettle as an academic, but they couldn't believe that. It happened. Uh, uh, this, it took uh, six, uh, six or eight months or something for them to the faculty that finally, uh, the committee and so on, that finally agreed to making me a senior person in the medical school, in the, in the university. And be a, and, uh, they say with Brown, you're a professor, you're a professor of the university. You're not even uh, uh, isolated uh, in the medical school. <laughs> you, sit, you sit next to the classicists and so on and so forth, and they just couldn't understand that. In fact, getting appointments in family medicine once we started the thing was horrendous because we did it. Now there is a special committee for appointments and promotions in the medical school, but we had no special committee. So I would appear in front of this august group of people who had no concept of what I was trying to do and who had a strong feeling that maybe it wasn't the kind of thing that Brown University ought to be doing. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, the first person I had I convinced to come in and be on the faculty was John Cunningham, who was a practitioner in Pawtucket, a very distinguished fellow, an outstanding physician, a wonderful teacher. But he'd never published a paper in his life. I think he had one in his residency with Go Worth or something. And of course, publication is the uh, essence of academia nowadays, I think, unfortunately. But uh, so they could, he needed to have some sort of a, Senior appointment, try to make him an associate professor. That was absolutely uh, mind boggling for that committee. So it took me a while to get my, uh, my feet on the ground and a while to convince people that I had some, some substance that was worth the university's investing. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, it was, so it was a struggle from that point of view. The university is a struggle to become as a medical, as an academic, so-called academic medical professor. And in the uh, general uh, yeah, medical uh, establishment is a struggle to establish the concept of having generalists, which was felt to be, let's say, a, a regressive kind of move. So they were, they, the first years were very difficult. On the other hand, uh, I've, I've been accused of, enjoy, of, of, being, of enjoying being involved in, in controversy. I don't. I usually feel 
I'm happy about it. I mean, I got into all kinds of conflicts with the hospitals in those early days. And, um, and when I remarked to one of the, the CEOs of one of the hospitals, where I don't know why I'm doing this for a living, I used to make twice as much practice having a good time. <laughs> I don't know why I ever did this in my life. Uh, he said, I said look, listen, to, look what happened to us today. I had come, come out of a fiery meeting. You know, I said, that's really an unpleasant way to spend your time. He said, oh, I watched your day. He said, you loved every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure that I had the insight necessary to know, but I know, I know I was having a good time. I know I never regretted doing what I did, uh, come with a leading practice, uh, which I loved. Uh, and I tried to remain uh, a clinician for many years after I came here, and I did to some extent, because with only two people, two faculty in family medicine, when we started the thing, uh, uh, Cunningham and I, uh, then we, we were the only teacher, clinical teachers, so we did have clinical responsibility, and I loved that too. But then uh, the an administrative burden gradually became much too, uh, uh, too overwhelming. And I gradually uh, had to give up time in the clinic and seeing patients and so on and so forth. Could you say a little more about those early years then, about uh, 70, so it sounds like you arrived in 70? I arrived, I was the voluntary person attending a lot of community health organizational meetings in 73. I agreed to come here in early 74 and uh, actually full time leave my practice. Mm -hmm. as, an, as an associate dean and, at that time? As the associate dean. I was the only other dean. There was Stan Aronson, who was the dean, and then there, there was me. That, that was it. That was the whole administration in those days. Uh, we had a wonderful woman, Ruth Sauber, who uh, was kind of the overall house mother and uh, did a little bit of everything that one would do in a medical school. But she was not a physician. I didn't have any professional background. And were, then were you full time after 75 in, in family I was medicine? Still, I, I was, well, no, I had several full time jobs. Yeah, I was full time. I was full time in family medicine, except I was also full time associate dean, and uh, and I had a, uh, some residual responsibilities that were that were left over my previous incarnation, like being chairman of a board of a university in Southeast Massachusetts, and and still running that uh, uh, chronic disease and rehabilitation thing in Vaughan River because that's where the students were rotating through. Uh -huh. And uh, being the director of a two and five apartment apartment house for disabled people with all kinds of problems, um, so it was, a, it was a very very busy time. And what was your title in family medicine? In family medicine, I was the chief of the section, uh, uh, which was a part of the department. Well, we did. They wouldn't let us have departments because they didn't want to have a medical school at Brown. So there were no medical school departments. The whole division of biology and medicine was considered one department in the university. That department, which included all the biology and PhD work and so on, was, uh, uh, was run by Vice President Galetti. Then within that department, there was essentially this uh, program or division of, uh, of uh, medicine. And within that, you couldn't have another department if they were <laughs> They already were in this big department, even though it was called a division. So each of the uh, now departments were called sections. So there's a section of medicine, a section of surgery, and so on. Now, we were in even worse trouble than that in family medicine, <coughs> because they weren't ready to make us a section. We didn't have enough faculty and so on anyway. So, <coughs> so we became uh, whatever you might call us. A, uh, we couldn't be a program, because the whole thing was a program. We couldn't be a section, but we were some sort of a division of the uh, department of, or the section of community health. Uh, and we stayed that way for many years until the, uh, uh, the uh, accreditation, uh, family medicine accreditation people did not like that at all. They wanted independent departments from their family medicine. <coughs> and so we ultimately had the bout of their pressure uh, when they come around for accreditation visits of the and uh, so the, the, by that time we had developed enough faculty and we had student rotations and residency and uh, even a few people doing some research. <coughs> so uh, um, 
uh, they felt that we could become our own section. That, that's one of the, uh, <coughs> the uh, but it was years before I could find a, a chairman or a chief of that um, uh, section of the division of Vermont, <coughs> because there weren't any academic people, uh, by at least by Brown's definition of academic, but most universities in family medicine, since it had just started as a specialty. Uh, uh, kind of originally incubated in the late 60s, but really didn't get going. Back when we were in a, there were very few residencies when we started ours in the early 70s. So <coughs> the, uh, there were no, senior, there were no, there were very few faculty in family medicine, and there were almost no senior faculty who might qualify to be a chief and a professor at Brown. Since they say it was, it was, it was the, just having a professor of family medicine at Brown no matter what its credentials would have considered, was considered by the university faculty as kind of a visit from an alien planet. You know. uh, uh, so uh, it, was tough, it was difficult to get a chairman. I remained the chairman or the chief or whatever you'd like to call me at that time. And the residency for years. director? And the residency director, too. So, uh, I was doing all those jobs at the same time. The, uh, um, and we ultimately found there were some retread in family medicine who were actually trained in other specialties, particularly by pediatrics, who had gone and taken some extra training and qualified for boards in family medicine and become family medicine people, and they already had some sort of, often had some senior status in pediatrics, so they kind of uh, looked like senior people uh, more so than the people who were homegrown in family medicine. and. Uh, so we ultimately found a fellow like that uh, who came and took the thing over from me. His name was Hokeiser. I think you probably be familiar with him. Um, and so there was a very great struggle at the university, a great struggle in terms of the medical establishment in general and the medical school. Uh, nobody understood that at all. And of course, I was, as I said before, I was a mind boggling. Uh, experience for this whole university. I, uh, I've been asked sometimes whether I can think of any other example of a fellow, a physician who came from a non-academic community and uh, became the, eventually the dean of an Ivy League medical school. And I, I, they, well, not to me, I can't think of any other examples. There are some quasi-examples in some very small state medical schools. There were none of us in the Ivy League and private prestigious medical school or the university. Uh, so that, that took many years and took uh, building credibility for the, both the generalist enterprise, for the family medicine enterprise in particular, and also for this uh, generalist position from uh, an alien territory. Fall, Fall River, uh, had a very negative connotation anyway. A famous remark about Fall River, the, uh, uh, it was Barnaby Keeney who was the president of Brown at the time, and the Brown has recurrently had uh, pressure from the city to pay taxes and so on, and they're not doing enough for either Rhode Island or the city and so on, and this is a particular uh, time of pressure on the president of the university, and he famously remarked to the mayor, he said, you know, if you want to see what Providence would look like without Brown, just go over to Fall River. <laughs> and that, that, that remark followed me for, for quite a while after I got here. And uh, so, <laughs> not quite accurate, but there's some truth to that. Um, so that was the, the whole thing was a struggle initially, and the struggle is not over, actually. The, uh, to say journalism has lost ground in the last uh, decade, uh, and uh, family medicine has suffered from that general decline in generalist uh, interest and uh, support, and the uh, ascendancy of, uh, of high-tech medicine. And one of my missions, I became rather active in the Association of American Medical Colleges. And, uh, I spent uh, 10 years on the Accreditation Committee, the United States Accreditation of Medical School, and so on. 
And one of the things that I try to try to convince people is that high technology medicine and generalist medicine are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're both highly necessary to run a, a balanced uh, medical enterprise in any country. But it's a hard thing for physicians to swallow. Apparently. And then after uh, the kind of 75, 76, 77, when you were, it sounds like I had at least three hats on, you found a new chair. Did you move then slowly back to, to the medical school? Um, what was your role then for the next few years? Well, uh, I never really moved. I had these multiple uh, sites. Uh, I always had the office in the uh, medical school administration building. In Arnold Laboratory? In Arnold Laboratory. Uh, and uh, I was building that up. I started to hire some assistant associate deans uh, when I became dean. And, uh, but also I had uh, people I brought in when I was associate dean. What, what year did you become dean? I became dean in 1981. Hmm. Uh, but it, uh, there was a transitional period, uh, a rather uh, uh, abrupt transition from the previous dean. So I really functioned for a year or so before that in the, in the capacity without the title. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, there, since there were only two administrators in this whole enterprise, and Stan, Stan Aronson and I uh, were very compatible, he was a very academic fellow, very interested in students and education, curriculum, and so on. And I was a very um, uh, clinical fellow, uh, interested in community relations and uh, public policy, and so on. So uh, we did really divided the medical school in two. Uh, without any uh, uh, reference to uh, who was the dean and who was the associate dean. It was, very, it was a very cordial, happy relationship. Um, so the, uh, uh, I always maintained my office at uh, Memorial and uh, uh, when I taught in my teaching role, and I saw some patients and so on. I was at Memorial at that time. I wanted to stay clinically. One of the things which was real tragic for me, at least I felt that way, was my loss of uh, clinical uh, encounters with real people outside of the uh, rarefied air of the ivory tower. I mean, there's a very strong streak in here, that blue colorful river. Uh, I like to be out there with what I call real people. And uh, well, I love I love this place. I mean, it's my second home. I an expert admire and. and, and uh, feel very uh, comfortable with Brown, but I needed some of that other stuff too, like the, well, the clinical and the human kind of interaction. So I tried to maintain that, and I guess it was a losing battle, and after I'd been dean for six years, uh, I, went, I went to the president of the university and I said, uh, I have to resign because I, I'm not happy with that real clinical involvement. And, outside and the institution and, uh, and the other thing I said I spent a long, most of my life learning to become what I, uh, I hope not uh, unrealistically felt was the best doctor I knew. I, re I really felt I, good. I didn't know I, I didn't know anybody better and, uh, and that was confirmed by many people in Boston so I with all the and I lo I'm losing it. I, I felt like you know I had to I had to be fully engaged in order to maintain those skills. And I didn't I didn't feel like I was I was as good a doctor after six years of, of this overwhelming deaning. And I didn't feel like I wanted to be anything but the best doctor I knew. So I wanted to quit. And he said, No, you can't quit. And, and he said, But what we'll do is we'll give you a sabbatical. Go be a doctor somewhere. And so I did. And they said, when you come back, we're going to arrange it so you've got at least a third of your time in clinical work and so on and so forth. So I went to Oxford University and practiced at the John Radcliffe Hospital in the clinics there. And it was a wonderful experience. I felt that I was getting back some of my skills and some of my knowledge. I came back with this uh, ambitious plan to be a third clinician and two thirds administrator. Well, you're an administrator yourself, I know, but this was a 
rapidly growing enterprise at that point, and uh, we still hadn't filled in the whole administration. And, uh, mm -hmm. about, what year, about what year was this? I came back in, uh, uh, let's see, uh, about 19, uh, I went to Oxford, I became dean in 1981, I went to Oxford around 1986, I think I got there actually two years in 1986. And, uh, and so I got back and uh, the place was, I, in fact, I, I actually became kind of a semi commuter from uh, Oxford. I, I was back six times hmm. during that six months because there was nobody else here at that point uh, that could do what I was doing. And uh, the, uh, so therefore, the, you know, it was the, maybe 87 or something like that, that I uh, came back with my new, dis my new job description as dean, which didn't last hardly a month. And the next thing, I just couldn't do it. But at that point, I was so committed that I, uh, I uh, with, uh, with really great sadness, I was, Losing what I spent my whole lifetime developing, but I was doing this. It was important. I thought this job was very important, uh, and uh, and I also enjoyed this environment very much too. And I got involved in research activity and grant activity and so on. So I had ongoing things. I hired a lot of people, young people who I uh, wanted to see make progress. I would be helpful to them. So I, I, I was able to rationalize giving up clinical work. Uh, I tried to do it again when I retired completely. That was in 1992, supposedly. I retired as dean. Uh, I went down to uh, with a visiting professor at Georgetown University Medical School. By that time, in order to be what I was, I'd have to go back to the four years of medical school and the residency. That wasn't going to work. <laughs> So I have to try here a little while again, how to get that up. Well, so what were some of the major activities that happened during the ten, you were dean for 10 years then, it sounds like. Well, oh, actually about 12 years. 12 years, so what were some of the, what happened during that time period? Some of your major accomplishments, some of the battles? Well, uh, we, had one of, we had developed uh, um, something of a uh, skeletal administration, someone to, uh, be a the assistant dean of students, uh, the faculty, uh, folks here, the faculty. We developed a con continuing medical education program in the community uh, position, so we had to have somebody uh, to do that. We had an assistant dean for continuing medical education. Uh, we had a admissions office, people, and so on. It was a very big building program for uh, The second is, uh, I, developed, I wanted to develop certain kinds of research that I felt were relevant to what I thought was important and with my interests. So we developed things like, uh, I was the original director of the uh, Gerontology uh, Center. Uh, and we developed a program for the care, for the research and the care of elderly people, mostly long-term care, chronic disease care, and so on, which was my interest back there. Uh, and I was the principal investigator of the uh, very large grants uh, out of that center. Uh, in particular, we were the ones who did the uh, research for the federal government that established the hospice movement in the United States with the Medicare reimbursement program. Very large. The cost of that was probably forty-five million dollars grant. It's kind of low on but five million came from the ground. But they uh, and. Uh, so I established that center. I uh, worked hard with, uh, with Dave Lewis uh, to establish, uh, the, with some some uh, resistance to establish that uh, uh, center of alcohol addiction studies, which is now flourishing also. Which was, didn't seem to people people didn't understand when I when I uh, I wanted to develop a center for health ser health services research because we wanted to study nursing homes and so on. And when I went to the child, we wanted to hire a health economist 
And I thought I ought to be doing all these things in collaboration with my colleagues in the university. So I went to the, to the chairman of the Department of Economics, and I, we had lunch together in the faculty club. I explained to him what I needed in terms of the health care economics of the professor, and I wanted to have a joint search. And he said, I'll tell you, Dave, uh, you don't want an economist, you want an accountant. So that was the, that was the kind of the status we had, you see. Uh, when I told uh, Vice President Galetti that I wanted to uh, have establish a health services research center, he, I, he said, no, I, I, I don't understand that. He said, that kind of thing is done by private consulting firms on Route 128. <laughs> uh, now, both of those are, those are the large, I think on campus they're the largest uh, Research support, external research support program in the, in the medical school on campus. Uh, so that we've demonstrated that this really research, you know, NIH and the Administration of Aging and so on. Uh, Robert Johnson Foundation was very interested in what I was doing. They gave me a lot of grants. So, uh, so we, we established centers which were multidisciplinary. One of the things I thought they should be uh, socially relevant. It should be multidisciplinary because this was a unitary campus. We've got to take advantage of the fact that we don't have to be introduced to the people of the, of the schools. Although a lot of people still were in the same family, supposedly, even though there's sometimes a little family stress there, but we were in the same family. And, uh, and that's worked out very well. We had started uh, things like collaboration with sociology. At one point, and the Center for uh, uh, Gerontology and Health Service Research. We had more PhD candidates doing in, uh, in medical sociology doing their uh, theses and having their advisors in the Department of Community Health and the Gerontology Center than they had in the Department of Sociology. We had the most attractive people at the, the graduate school. And we really had big grants. And so we developed a joint program with grants with Population Center over there in sociology. Uh, <coughs> we developed a biomedical ethics center with the uh, philosophy. In fact, the professor of philosophy, Dan Brock, became the director. We, I, I had him have time. Uh, uh, so we were trying to do multidisciplinary things, which were very difficult to do in most medical schools. You know, the, the medical schools are very bureaucratic divisions that we do in among departments, much less with the rest of the universities. They, they, medical schools are often in different cities even than the, than the universities. So there's, 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 a, there's a very difficult relationship to start establishing. We could do that better than uh, anybody I knew. And we also wanted to have socially relevant uh, programs so that we were not only in an ivory tower, but we had some relevance to the, the community and the, their needs and so on, like care of the elderly, addiction problems and so on. So <coughs> we developed several of those. We, the, during my tenure, we actually developed departments in the university. They managed, we managed to convince them now that we have large enough enterprise. That was a very uh, long, tedious process of, uh, because you have to get all kinds of criteria, and the criteria for faculty appointments, and different levels, and, uh, the program disposition is all that to be passed by the uh, by the central uh, faculty board, the academic council, and so on, and the university as well as the, the trustees. It took a long time to do that. We thought it would ten departments, um, and we uh, did recruit a lot of faculty in one of the hospitals. We tried to main, we tried to develop a very important part of this uh, medical enterprise. And, somewhat unique is that we have no university hospital we, and we actually occupied, we had uh, research and, uh, and educational affiliations with over 50 percent of all hospital beds in Rhode Island. I think it may be still the case, I don't follow it now, but while I was dean, it was. <coughs> we had eight affiliated hospitals who had previously been independent and competitive hospitals. We were trying to develop them into some collaborative venture into a single program. We we're trying to introduce academic work into service-oriented institutions. After all, the basic reason, there's always tension between physician and medical staff and faculty and hospital administration. 
that's even true of the university hospital in the high one, the university of them both. Uh, and the reason being that the directors of the, the administrators of, of uh, the universities are, are in the business of, of uh, education and uh, research. They're in the knowledge uh, business. Uh, knowledge business in the sense that in the creation of knowledge as well as the transmission of knowledge to subsequent generations. Hospitals have, uh, uh, traditionally are uh, not in that business at all. They're a service oriented. They're there to provide a very important service to populations. Uh, why should they get involved? The question is why should they get involved in education at all? It, uh, they ought to just be taking the product of those places that involve education and putting them to work. That's a tension, and there's a national tension that was acute here. Eight formerly independent, often uh, competitive hospitals, one university, which was only reluctantly getting into this game at all. Very, uh, I was told immediately by the president of the university that I was hired, because I was a clinical person, Brown will not participate in any clinical activity, per se. All of that will be done by the hospitals. Um, so we were, we, we even shunned what the hospitals were doing, much less how to participate with it. Uh, the, we, we, uh, very rapidly, it was already uh, established when I got here that the university would not themselves employ any clinical department faculty, full-time faculty. All of those would be, would be employed by hospitals. They would do a joint search so that both the hospital and the university were satisfied with the quality of the uh, candidate. But the, uh, from then on, the, uh, the candidate, the faculty were all uh, paid for, administered by, uh, Often, unfortunately, primary allegiance to a hospital rather than to a medical school. So, as you can see, this was a very difficult uh, band of rascals to put together into one uh, one coherent episode, uh, enterprise. We, I met every. Uh, so that's right. So the question is, how did you, how did you do it? Well, uh, with great difficulty and often painfully, but as I say at least according to the, at that time, CEO of the Rhode Island Hospital, well, I thought I was feeling pain, he could detect that I was feeling great pleasure in this, <laughs> this enterprise. And I have to, you know, as I reflect on it, I spent my whole life in the public sector uh, after I got out of medical school. I thought, I was one of the things I, I was critical of my, the University of Chicago was a super ivory tower. It, it, it was, dead set against producing any practitioner. If you want to be a practitioner, they didn't want you in the school. And I was, didn't want to be a practitioner, actually. Uh, and there were no, no practicing physicians allowed in the university hospital. All of them were full time. All of them were employed by the university, not by the hospital. This was it. And uh, you know, sort of pristine uh, environment. We had nothing but scorn for all those fellows out there who were not smart enough to be professors at the University of Chicago. That's why they out there in Evans and the Sentinel Tank patients. Uh, so uh, uh, this was a very difficult thing to get this kind of a, a university together with the people in the, in the community hospitals, eight community hospitals, one with a veterans hospital. We met every Friday morning at 7.30 over breakfast at the Butler Hospital private dining room, where we would try to hammer out collaborative uh, ventures. Uh, we would manipulate uh, uh, Letty went to the other early on, Stan Aarons went to the other, he would be, uh, we'd cajole, we would uh, uh, use our influence in other ways, trustees or whatever, in order to get this thing painfully put together. And it, and it was often not very comfortable even after it was supposedly uh, put together into a, into a unified enterprise. Uh, I, another, I once asked another hospital administrator uh, after one of these uh, sessions, they said, you know, I'm such a pain in the butt for you. Why do you want to have the medical school here at all? Why don't you just go ahead and run your hospital? His insight was the only reason we have them is we want to have the residents because they give us cheap labor. 
Now that's, uh, that was pretty far afield from what I thought about this enterprise. <laughs> but that was the nice that we had to deal with in this uh, in the community group. Uh, so, that, you know, it was a great cultural gap and uh, uh, difficulty from that point of view. Uh, I've rambled on, but I forgot. No, no. I, well, I think um, some of the some of the things that you accomplished during the time. Well, the big changed, thing I did, and how I, you did it. The big, uh, the very few resources and almost no budget. Well, a faculty that didn't support uh, a university that didn't support you. Uh, sounds like CEOs that weren't always the most. Uh, well, they were tough at times. Yeah. Well, the, th I would, the things I came to do, I was felt very uh, comfortable that I did them. I, one, I brought a an atmosphere of uh, social relevance, social activism. I was also known as a student in those days, as well as my previous uh, incarnation as of being involved in anti-war, uh, anti-nuclear, uh, student protest movements that we had in the late 60s and so on. I was on the board. Uh, so I wanted them to be, I, I, I developed a phrase which is used frequently over and over again here in our first brochure, that we were trying to produce uh, socially uh, relevant and socially responsible positions. Uh, I think that was the phrase. It's, it's in a lot of the literature back then. Uh, that was not a particularly uh, common view of medical school. In fact, it was uncommon. The second one is I wanted to develop, uh, so therefore we wanted educational programs as well as, as research programs which had that kind of social relevance and, uh, and the meaning to uh, the community and the population and the nation. You know, I, as I say, I was on all kinds of national committees too, trying to bring these insights. Uh, the, uh, the second thing I wanted to do was demonstrate that this kind of unitary faculty in this setting uh, uh, was, was an advantage in that we could develop multidisciplinary programs which would be very attractive uh, to uh, students, to uh, sponsors, and so on, such as gerontology, which is a little sociology, a little healthcare economics, a little medicine, uh, a little bureaucratic problems, uh, very complex, or nothing more complex than, than uh, the problem of drug addiction and alcoholism in this society, and everything from the religious implication, the, 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 the politics, the, the funding, and to the academic questions of how do you treat people like that, is it biochemical abnormality, which we're just beginning to learn, and so on. So we wanted to develop multidisciplinary programs to show that this is a good way to run a medical school, not in isolation, but we, we ought to be a member. And I wrote a, I wrote a paper at that time trying to explain this to people, uh, which I may have sent to you, I don't know, it was called Medicine in the University, uh, which indicates that this, this is something which, uh, an opportunity that we have lost by separating medical schools and that uh, medical schools are, an act, are, are a bona fide university discipline both from the point of view of what they can bring to the university and what the university can bring to them. Uh, so that was the second. The, thir the third the one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to develop a teaching program which, which uh, reflected these uh, uh, viewpoints. Uh, now, family medicine was a good example of that, but that was uh, uh, thrust upon me. That wasn't my own uh, initiative, uh, although I became an enthusiastic. I believe the establishment of family medicine was never enthusiastic about me because I, I was not a family medicine doctor. A problem. But in any they also had to agree that I was doing a good job making family medicine doctors. So. But, uh, but I wanted to. Uh, to develop a program where we could train medical students. And that was the, what is now kind of a jewel in the crown of brown, uh, and has been for some time, the program in liberal medical education. I must, I can truthfully say, that was my idea. I hammered it through the university with great difficulty, changing the coursework with Bryant and MD, and for having on the graduate, you know, giving up one, one semester 
chemical organic chemistry which was a great blow to the canvas, etc. So it was a it was a harrowing experience again trying to sell this idea that instead of having a medical school, traditional conventional medical school, we ought to get young people uh, come here and begin to educate them in a liberal arts fashion to be the kind of citizens and the kind of broadly, broadly uh, socially useful. The same thing that it says in the Brown, I uh, think, you know, would be one of the, something like social u- usefulness and re- reputation or something that says in the Brown logo, a mile, mile way back to the founder of the university. It, it's a very interesting, I can't, I can't, I'm having, I'm having trouble paraphrasing it, but it's very, I think, a very, very good motto for a university. I think uh, we'll need to end the interview today, Um, although uh, we hardly got to, uh, uh, we've got to only a fraction of of what uh, you have to say. Um, Just with one. You know, you ask an old man a question and get a rambling answer. (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) I was just wondering if uh, you could do one last thing before we end, and that is we're going to be having the 30th reunion of of family medicine. If you wanted to uh, wish them, any good wishes? Uh, hopefully, you'll be there yourself. I will. Um, but if, you, if there's anything you'd like to wish uh, to them, and uh, and we'll end today. Um. I I uh, I'm very pleased to extend my congratulations on the 30th anniversary of the family medicine department here at Brown. Uh, when I was putting this together and uh, uh, encountering the great difficulties that we had, I never envisioned such a wonderful enterprise. Uh, as we have now, and I, uh, uh, I think it's one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. Okay. Well, thank you so much.